بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد النبي وأزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وذريته وآل بيته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد Dear brothers In the last khutbah we started talking about Abu Talib the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how he courageously defended the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and risked all he owned and he risked even his own life and his own children and his own family in protection of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the various lines of poetry that he said and are still preserved till today talking about the Prophet ﷺ and this whole situation. They started by asking him gently to stop the Prophet ﷺ from calling for this new religion. But then he refused. He allowed him to do whatever he willed. Then they came to him and they tried to pressure him more. And he called the Prophet ﷺ, as you saw in the last khutbah, and the Prophet ﷺ was very clear that he cannot abandon this mission that was assigned to him by the Creator. And he told them, if you can bring me a flame from the sun, then I would be able to leave this mission. And of course, it was impossible. And again, Abu Talib supported him. But then they came to him and they tried to bargain with him and they said to him, okay, we'll bring you this young man, just summarizing what we said in the last khutbah. You take him as your son, and he was the most strong and most handsome young man in Quraysh. And you give us Muhammad, we kill him. That's exactly what they said. And then Abu Talib was very stern in his response. He said, you give me your son so that I feed him for you. And you take my son to kill him. And that was when the situation escalated between him and the rest of the tribe and all the clans within the tribe. Then he started, you know, saying these lines of poetry because poetry would spread very easily in Arabia to ex explain the whole situation that is evolving between him and the other clans of the family. He tried to talk to them nicely, tried to remind them of all the favors and all the good days they had together. Maybe they would be more lenient and they would stop this vicious attack, but still. And in some of these lines, he expressed his intense love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Which means that Allah has instilled the love of Ahmad, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in my heart. دَأْبَ الْمُحِبِّ الْمُوَاصِلِ فَمَنْ مِثْلُهُ فِي النَّاسِ أَيُّ مُؤَمَّلٍ إِذَا قَاسَهُ الْحُكَّامُ عِنْدَ التَّفَاضُلِ He says, there's nobody like him. In all his qualities, there's no one like him. And we saw how he praised him and talked about him, that he was a supporter and protector of the orphans and the widows and the weak. And he was generous and kind and respectful. All these qualities that he saw from the Prophet ﷺ, he lived and he raised him. Halimun Rashidun Aadun Ghayru Ta'ishin. He says he's very patient, he's very just. How can someone like this, how can they become enemies to someone like this? How can they even think about harming someone like this? Or even thinking about killing him? يوالي إله ليس عنه بغافلي لقد علموا بأن لقد علموا أن ابننا لا مكذب لدينا ولا يعنى بقول الأباطل. He says they all know that he's not a liar and he has never lied in his life. حدبت بنفسي دونه وحميته ودفعت عنه بالذرة والكلاكل. He says I will put my soul and my nafs ahead to be killed before he would be killed. And I will sacrifice my children and my family and all that I own. Subhanallah. It's amazing that just tribal pride and blood connection that he had with the Prophet ﷺ would make him sacrifice so much. While the religious connection that we have with the Prophet ﷺ, we as Muslims, is weaker than what this man had in defense of the Prophet ﷺ. It is actually shameful 
that we as Muslims don't have this kind of zeal towards defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Abu Talib felt that Quraysh and he got the news that they were determined to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does he do? Then he calls on the rest of his, uh, his family, Banu Hashim, and he tells them of the conspiracy. And I'm going a little bit ahead, little bit ahead because this g went on for years. We will go back again to other events that happened earlier, because, but since this event of the siege that the Abu Talib and Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib were exposed to in Shiab in the valley of Abu Talib, is very important and it has connection with the stance of Abu Talib and what he did in protection of the Prophet Sallallahu So we will continue this, but then inshallah we'll go back again to where we stopped at the seerah. So when he felt that they were going to assassinate him and this was coming inevitably, he told the rest of his family about this conspiracy. You know what he did? He actually had his whole family surround the Prophet Sallallahu house and be with him at all times, so that if he is exposed to any attack, they would defend him. And he had to take him to a place called Shab Abi Talib. It's a valley near Mecca, to make sure that they had enough defenses, that the mushrikeen cannot get to the center, because it is all surrounded, this valley will be surrounded by him and the rest of his family, and the Prophet ﷺ would be in protection in the midst of them. When Quraysh saw that, they had one of two choices. Either they go into an all-out war with this clan of Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib ibn Abdul Manaf, and then it, these were big clans. Then the whole tribe of Quraysh would basically exterminate its own self. That was one choice. Or the other choice, they said, okay, we will do an embargo, an economic and social embargo on Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib, and anybody that stands with them. The whole of Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib, they stood by the Prophet Sallallahu except Abu Lahab. His uncle Abu Lahab said, no, I will be with the rest of Quraysh. He was the odd exception. But all these people, and the vast majority were non-Muslims, and Abu Talib was not a Muslim. But this tribal pride that he had in him, and this kinship with the Prophet Sallallahu and this long, lifelong relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu would not allow him to give up or to abandon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this embargo and siege happened in the seventh year. And that's why I told you we're skipping a little bit, but inshallah we'll go back again. In the seventh year in Mecca, that was basically just maybe five, six years before, before Hijrah. And what happened is they were cornered in this small valley, Shab Abi Talib, and the Quraysh wrote up an agreement between them that nobody deal in any kind of dealing with those people who are protecting the Prophet ﷺ. No financial trade, don't give them food, don't talk to them, don't help them in any way. And this led to the Muslims and of course all these two big clans who were holed up in this small valley to suffer extreme hunger to the extent that narrations say that if somebody would be passing by this valley at night, he would hear the crying and the screaming of the children and the crying of their mothers because of lack of food and hunger, subhanAllah. Do you know how long this siege lasted? You think it could be days or weeks or months? This lasted for three full years. Quraysh wrote up this agreement and put it inside the Kaaba. They felt it was a religious duty to fight the Prophet ﷺ and Islam and the Muslims. For three whole years, you would say, so how could they survive? Some of the Arabs of Quraysh who had still some honor and some pride and some mercy in their heart would sneak some food to the extent that some of them would bring a camel full of food out close to the valley and allow it because he didn't want to go into a conflict with the rest of Quraysh. As if the camel ran away or got lost and things like this. And one time even Hakim ibn Hizam, one of the 
And Hakim ibn Hizam was not a Muslim at the time, but he later on became a Muslim. Hakim ibn Hizam one time tried to sneak a camel, and I think Abu, Abu Jahl stood up for him and told him, where are you going? Where are you taking this food? And so on. And a fight broke off, and him or some, one of his companions hit Abu Jahl on his head, and basically uh, he was wounded. So yes, they managed to survive by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, but it was a trial. And Muslims are trialed in different ways and different stages of their, of their, of their path towards Allah Azza wa Jal and, and of their lives. The courage of Abu Talib was that him, he basically was on the watch at night. Him and a few people from the tribe would basically patrol the whole valley throughout the night and he would sleep during the day. Imagine this. Give me a Muslim that would do something like this. Patrol the valley at night and then sleep during the day. And he assigned Al-Abbas, his brother Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet and Hamza. And they were Muslims. By that time, Umar al-Khattab and Hamza were already Muslims. And he assigned Al-Abbas at one end of the valley with a group of young men and Hamza at the other end with a group of young men to protect all this for the protection of the Prophet Sallallahu And the leader of all this, the leader of all this mission of protection of the Prophet Sallallahu was not a Muslim man. It was his uncle Abu Talib. I will just read you a hadith that shows you how much suffering these people went through. <clears throat> Bismillah. Utbah ibn Ghazwan, he says, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي سَابِعَ سَبْعَةٍ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَا لَنَا مَا لَنَا طَعَامٌ إِلَّا وَرَقَ الشَّجَرِ حَتَّى قَرْحَتْ أَشْدَاقُنَا قَرْحَتْ أَشْدَاقُنَا He says, I was one of the early seven Muslims that joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there came a time that we had no food except we were eating the leaves, the leaves of the trees and the bushes. Uh, and the weeds, basically, because Mecca, there was no real good trees. Some of them were just some weeds that come out. And that's what they ate. He said, until even our gums were bleeding. Also, Sa'ad ibn Abi Uqas, and look, look at this hadith and what he says. And this is an authentic hadith as well. He says that we suffered so much in Mecca, along with the Prophet Sallallahu and we, 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 we were patient and we persevered. He says, one time at night during the time of the Shab, during that siege, he says, I went out basically to use the washroom. He wanted to urinate. He says, and I heard a sound, it was dark. He heard the sound, you know, as the urine was hitting the ground, you can feel, you can tell if it's just sandy ground, soft ground, or something hard. So he felt the sound as if there was something hard the urine was falling upon in the middle of the night. So after he finished, he says, I tried to see what this was, and I found it was a dried piece of skin of a camel, dried piece of skin of a camel. So he says, I took it and I washed it. Then I basically ahraqtuha. He didn't say cook it. He says, I burnt it because he knew it would have some kind of nourishment. He burnt it. Then I basically grinded it until it became a powder. And I put some water on it and I drank it. And that gave me power for three days. So gave him energy for three days. Subhanallah. Remember these stories, inshallah, when you're fasting. And how these people suffered so much. And for us, alhamdulillah, you know when you're going to eat and, you, and when you, you will abstain from eating. You know your fridge is full. You know you have the luxury, you have the air condition, or you have the, the heat. You have everything. We are living like kings. Because kings of the past did not have what each individual, each one of us has today. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله 
اللهم صل على محمد النبي وأزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وذريته وآل بيته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما This siege lasted for three years and then it ended there's two different reports here one of them is that Prophet Sallallahu told his uncle Abu Talib to go and speak with Quraysh and tell them that he will show them a sign from Allah because those people were so deluded, they, they were thinking that they're pleasing Allah with what they're doing. They put this agreement in the Kaaba. He said that Allah has sent an insect, Al Arada, that ate this whole agreement, whatever they wrote it upon, usually they wrote on camel skin, and it left only out the name of Allah, whatever, because they used, used, they used the name of Allah. And when they went and saw that, they were shocked, and that was the reason for pressure to mount on them to end this siege. Or it is mentioned in another narration that some of the elders of Quraysh felt that this was not going anywhere, and they felt really sorry and pity for all these people who are crying at night, and all these children and women who are crying at night out of hunger, and could be this way or that way or could both of things have happened we don't know exactly but this is one of two ways this is how it ended i would like to finish the khutbah with mentioning that abu talib despite all this sacrifice unfortunately and very unfortunately he would not he would not even utter the shahada he had so much pride in the religion of his ancestors that he even refused to utter the shahada even at the, uh, on his deathbed. This is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim and all the collections of hadith. This cannot be denied in any way. That Prophet ﷺ came to him on his deathbed and he says to him, My uncle, Ya Amma, Qul la ilaha illallah. Say, there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. Ashhadu laka biha yawm al qiyamah. I will use that, just this shahada with nothing else, because all the good deeds before that don't count, because they, was, they were not based on Iman. They were based on pride. He says, just say this word. And he's on his deathbed. It can be used, of course, if anybody utters the shahada even while dying, before the death basically reaches its peak, Allah will accept that. He says, Ashhadu laka biha yawm al qiyamah. I will testify for you. Uh, make intercession for you yawm al qiyamah. What did Abu Talib say? He says, لَوْلَا أَن تُعَيِّرَنِي قُرَيْشِ يَقُولُونَ مَا حَمَلُهُ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا جَزَعُ الْمَوْتِ He says, then I will be a mockery of Quraysh. They will say that because he was afraid of death, he said the shahada to appease his, 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 his nephew. Subhanallah. Sometimes the pride is good in certain things, but for the pride to reach this level, that he is dying and he doesn't want to say the shahada because he doesn't want to show any weakness, he feels this is weakness of him to give the shahada at the time of his death. Of course, the Arabs had sometimes extreme pride. We were one time reading a hadith, an authentic hadith, in which uh, during a battle between the Muslims and non-Muslims, one of the Muslims basically hit, uh, he was having some kind of sword fight with one of the mushrikeen, the, the polytheists, and then the polytheist realized how strong the Muslim was uh, in front of him, so he started running away. And then that Sahabi called on him. He says to him, you coward, you're running away from me. So the man, although he knew that he was no match to that fighter, he came back just because of that word. He felt it was against his pride to run away even from death. And he came back and he was killed. But to have this kind of pride, pride is, is something that is not virtuous. And then, of course, he died as a non-Muslim, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ You do not have the power to guide anyone, to guide whom you love. It is he, Allah, who guides whom he ever he wills. وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ Allah knows best on the inside who deserves this guidance. Now, some people might be shocked and say, okay, but all that he's done, we have to know that a human being has two obligations. 
the main obligation on any human being is to show th at least the least level of respect to his creator, which is to acknowledge the creator and his oneness and to acknowledge that no one deserves to be worshipped but him. That is the very least, the shahada, even verbally. This is the creator who brought you to this life and nourished you throughout your 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, protected you, provided for you, gave you such and such and such. And for a human being to be so stingy and so evil and wicked that he doesn't want to even acknowledge, even verbally, that alone would make the Jannah forbidden for him. Actually, it's an insult to Allah Azza wa Jal. There's a hadith in which, uh, it's hadith Qudsi, in which Allah says, شَتَمَنِي إِبْنُ آدَمْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ ذَلِكَ وَكَذَّبَنِي إِبْنُ آدَمْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ ذَلِكَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ ذَلِكَ He says, the son of Adam has lied against me and he has no right to do so. And the son of Adam has insulted me. It's an insult to Allah to basically associate anything in worship with him. And he has no right to do so. He says, his lie against me is when he claims that I'm not able to recreate him. And he has to know, the son of Adam has to know that the initial creation was not any easier than the recreation. Both are easy for Allah Azzawajal. He says, as for his insult towards me, is when he says that I have a son. And I am the one and only who has no son, who has not begotten and does not beget, and has no rival. It is not us who decides what is befitting to Allah. He is the one who decides what is considered an insult against him and what is not considered an insult. Allah considers attributing a son or associating a partner or a wife or a daughter to him a big insult. In Surah Maryam we read, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَ And they say the merciful has taken a son. لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا Surely you have brought a monstrous thing. تَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتُ يَتَفَرْطَنَّ مِنْهُ وَتَنْشَقُّ الْأَرْضُ وَتَخِرُوا الْجِبَالُ هَدَّا Thereby the heavens are nearly torn and the earth split asunder and mountains fall crashing down and da'aw lil-Rahmani walada because they have ascribed a son to the merciful. A form of association with Allah. This is how evil it is in the sight of Allah. If we don't view it this way, this is our problem. But Allah does not accept. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushruka bi. He says, I will never forget this association, shirk, polytheism, in worship with me. Whatever its kind is, if you attribute a son, or even if you associate in worship with him, one of his prophets, Isa was a prophet, Muhammad is the prophet. We have some Muslims today who elevate the prophet Muhammad to the level of Allah. And they ask the prophet for to do things for them that only Allah can do. This is shirk. Just like the Christians committed shirk with Isa ibn Maryam. So and those, this is all well known. So we have to be very careful. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ in the Quran. فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ It's a final statement. Whoever associates with Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah has forbidden the garden, the heavens, for him. And his final abode is the fire of hell. وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And the wrongdoers will have no, no helpers. Prophet Sallallahu could not even make, was not even allowed to make dua. We saw this before in the seerah. Was not even allowed to make dua and istighfar for his own mother. So we have to be very careful with regard to shirk. It is the only sin that Allah Azza wa Jal will never forgive.